Good evening, everyone. Steve's got you on mute, and that's um, uh, expected. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, start an opening prayer, and then I'm going to let Steve uh, talk about how we can proceed here, and uh, and then we'll take it from there. Let us pray. Pour your grace into our hearts, O Lord, that we who have known the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, announced by an angel to the Virgin Mary, may by his cross and passion be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> And blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Steve, why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, orient, give, give an orientation here a little bit. Sure, well, Bishop, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Steve Welch. Um, we, so as, uh, as the Bishop noted, when you came into the room, you were, you were muted automatically. Uh, and in general, that's the way you should keep your, uh, your phone. There's a, there's a mute button next to your name in the participants list. Uh, as I see folks who are unmuted, I will, I will mute you. It's just we have not right now 43 people in this room and, uh, Last week we had close to 70 open microphones caused just a, a havoc of, uh, of, uh, of cacophony of sound. Um, in terms of handling how, how we'll ask questions of the bishop, um, there may be different times when the bishop calls for questions, um, but or you know whenever you want to, you can raise your hand. And the way to do that is um, if you click the participants button, which is down toward the bottom of your screen. It'll bring up a list of all, all participants uh, and there'll be a button there for raise your hand. When you click that button, a little symbol will go up next to your name so we know that you wanna ask a question. You can also use the chat window. And again, the chat button is down toward the bottom of the screen a little bit on the right. You can use the chat button to, um, to add uh, questions to, uh, to, the, to the bishop. Uh, when he's ready for them, I will read them out to him. So whichever way you you uh, you prefer to to do it. If we have people joining us on the phone, and I see a couple of phone numbers on there, um, to raise your hand, you dial star nine on your phone. That's star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when when we recognize you for a question, then I can un unmute you. Um, Bishop, am I missing anything? I think that'll do it. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to depend on you um, <clears throat> for all the question components and any, you know, anything you think I need to know because I'm going to, I can focus on the presentation and uh, and track the chat uh, and the raised hands as well. So um, great. So sure. you'll uh, and I should I should also ahead. mention uh, <clears throat> I'll post into the chat in a moment. Uh, everyone should have already gotten a link to the resources website that uh, has downloadable resources for this lesson. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, click uh, paste the link into the chat window once we get started. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Well, um, so let me pick it up with that. I, uh, first of all, prepared um, two, two pieces for you. Uh, one is um, an overview of John's gospel and gospels in general, which uh, basically recaps the work that we did last week, those who were uh, on the Bible study last week when we focused on John 9, the story of the man born blind from birth. Uh, I did a lot of background stuff on that, and I thought that I would just uh, create a, a resource for folks um, because I work from the premise of uh, that understanding of how the Gospels were created and, and, uh, and how they're organized. <clears throat> so that's there for you. And then the second resource was an outline uh, for tonight's session that I hope you got and that um, gave you suggested, I, I asked that if you're able to, uh, that you read John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, which is the, the opening prologue in John. And then John uh, 5, 25 to 30, uh, it's not a big deal if you didn't, I'm going to read that one um, early on here. 
And then the Gospel of John chapters 10 and 11. I'm really not going to spend time on 10 tonight. And we're really going to focus on chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. But uh, I always think that um, good Bible study really demands that we know contextually uh, what came uh, before in the Bible, because oftentimes it sets things up. And that's certainly true for this story. <clears throat> and then I had you look at a couple of passages that were outside of John, which I'm going to make some reference to. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, and Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. So um, uh, just be aware those resources are there. The outline is there. And if you did manage to see the outline, and if you printed it, then I left places for you to make notes as we go along tonight. Um, I have the slide up now with the study sources that I'm using. So, uh, you know, I just want to say up front, um, uh, everything, I, 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 don't, I know nothing. <laughs> I learn from others. And uh, these are the primary resources I'm using uh, for this study uh, as we're in John's Gospel. And uh, the New Oxford Annotated Study Bible, I said last week, is a resource I encourage everybody to have. It's a really first-rate resource, got great notes and introductions to every book of the Bible. Uh, it's something that you can have and, and keep for the rest of your lives. Um, so, I, you know, it's worth the investment. They're not cheap, but it's worth the investment. And then the other three commentaries, the Abingdon New Testament commentary uh, uh, on John by D. Moody Smith. I've been using that for years. Uh, and then I recently got the Catholic commentary on sacred scriptures, the Gospel of John um, by Francis Martin and William Wright IV, as well as interpretation series of Bible commentary for preaching and teaching John by Gerard Sloyan. So as we go along tonight, if I say uh, Martin and Wright, I'm referring to that resource. If I say Sloyan, I'm referring to that one. And if I say Smith, then I'm referring to the Abington commentary. Um, you know, in this, uh, in, in, in year A, we're, we're a lectionary church. I think most of you know that, meaning that the readings are prescribed by the church. Uh, we don't pick them out. Uh, clergy don't pick out the readings we read on Sunday morning. We're reading the same readings across the Episcopal Church, and in fact, much of Christendom, because we have a common lectionary that we share with Presbyterians and Lutherans and the Roman Catholic Church. So we're all reading the same readings on any given uh, Sunday. And, in, and we have a three-year lectionary cycle, year A, year B, year C. And in lectionary year A, which is the lectionary year that we're in uh, this year, it began uh, the first Sunday of Advent, in lectionary year A, when we get to Lent, after the first Sunday in Lent, um, when we always read an account of uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and depending on the lectionary year, we'll read that gospel's account. Uh, year A, we read Matthew. Year B, we read Mark. Year C, we read Luke. Uh, but at, in year A, after the first Sunday, we have a series of weeks in which we have these massive readings from John's gospel. And, um, and uh, you know, they're powerful readings, they're rich readings, dense with meaning, um, and, uh, and they're worth our study. So um, the week, uh, the second uh, Sunday in Lent, we had uh, the reading from uh, John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. And the week after that, a reading from John 4. Um, uh, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And, the, and then last week, of course, we had uh, from John chapter nine, the man born blind from birth. And this week, we've got the raising of Lazarus. And so that's where we're going to focus our attention tonight. Uh, chapter 11 of John's gospel, uh, the raising of Lazarus. Um, chapter 11 uh, relates the raising of Lazarus. It's the final and ultimate sign I'm putting that in quotes, sign, I'll remind you. In John's gospel, a sign is a miracle. In, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they use the word miracle. But here in John's gospel, a miracle is a sign. And so uh, chapter 11 relates the raising of Lazarus, the final and ultimate sign performed by Jesus in the so-called book of signs. And, uh, and in the resource that I uh, put online for you, and as I talked about last week, the basic structure of John's gospel that's accepted by almost everybody today is chapter one is a prologue. Chapters two to 12 are what's called the book of signs because that's where those miracles are. 
And then chapters 13 through 20 is the book of glory because it tells the passion, uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, which is all seen as one uh, act by God of glory uh, and redemption. And then, uh, and then the final chapter of John, chapter 21 is an epilogue. Um, so today we're gonna look at chapter 11 the story of the raising of Lazarus. This story is only told in John's gospel. This sign, this sign of the raising of Lazarus has been anticipated. It was anticipated in John chapter five at verse 25, which reads, very truly I tell you, it's 25 through 30, very truly I tell you the hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's John chapter five, verses 25. 30. Chapter 11 and the raising of Lazarus will bring to a head Jesus' conflict with the religious authorities. And you could see that conflict had been building. It's been building all from chapter 9, chapter in, and it's in 10. And if you looked at chapter 10, uh, you, you will see that uh, it has really uh, reached a fever pitch. The raising of Lazarus becomes the trigger that leads the authorities to seek Jesus' death. This is in contrast to the Synoptic Gospels, which portray Jesus' cleansing of the temple as the precipitating event leading to his arrest and execution. The, the Synoptic Gospels portray the cleansing of the temple late in Jesus' ministry, after he enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, during his only visit to the city. John, on the other hand, had portrayed the cleansing of the temple in chapter two of his gospel. And Jesus had traveled to Jerusalem in John's gospel multiple times for various festivals. You might well ask, well, who's right? Which one, you know, which one is historically accurate? Well, no one has a definitive answer to that. John, uh, we, we wanna remember these are not history books. They're not biographies in the strict sense that we understand those terms today. They have history and they have biography, but they are fundamentally proclamations about who Jesus is to the evangelists that wrote them in their church communities. And in John's gospel, uh, John is uh, really strong on high symbolism of who Jesus is. And um, uh, it may well be that, he, that for him, this raising of Lazarus was the more significant sign uh, and the one that would have prompted the authorities to act. Uh, he's certainly aware of the cleansing of the temple. Again, he's portrayed it, but in, in his gospel, it's earlier. Um, for the outline that I gave you and the outline that I'm gonna use tonight to break this large chapter into manageable pieces, I have used uh, the chapter outline that I found from Martin and Wright uh, in their book. And so, um, uh, this covers all of chapter 11, but it gives it to us in manageable pieces. And we're going to start with um, uh, part A, what's on your outline if you've got it in front of you, is part A, um, uh, the one you love is ill, which covers verses one through six. The one you love is ill. Uh, I, I suspect we can all, real, we are all resonating with that right now and, and kind of the fear and the, the, the we can, we can feel this one in our, in our bodies. Uh, it's stunning to me that we have this story of the raising of Lazarus while we're all in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, it's just, it's God, we've got to be feeling this one in our bones, I suspect. And the chapter opens with a terse introductory sentence. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, <clears throat> in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. The chapter seems to assume we know these characters, but this is their first appearance in John's gospel. The chapter seems to assume we know these characters, but this is their first appearance in John's gospel. The narrator tells us, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. 
the Greek is clear that this particular action has already happened, at least from the reader's perspective. Mary was the one, as you know, who anointed. But in John's gospel, the anointing of Jesus isn't related until chapter 12, the next chapter. In the synoptics, Jesus is anointed in a similar fashion by an unnamed woman before his arrest. In Mark 14, we read, while he was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper as he sat at table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the anointment and poured the ointment on his head. That's chapter 14, verse 3. Matthew offers an account almost identical to Mark's. The woman is not named, although in Mark, Jesus says about this, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. And that certainly seems to be the significance of this, even in John. Truly, I tell you, Mark writes, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. But Mark never names her. The characters of Martha and Mary appear in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, in a well-known story. There does not appear to be a clear connection between the story in Luke and the account of the raising of Lazarus in John 11. But the character of the two sisters is somewhat similar. This is also true of the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16. The poor man Lazarus, who has suffered greatly, dies, and Luke tells us is carried away by angels to be with Abraham. The rich man dies and goes to Hades, where he is tormented. And a part of this torment is that he can see Lazarus, whom he had ignored while they were both alive. The rich man begs for Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool the rich man's tongue as he is in agony from the flames. But Abraham refuses, essentially telling him he had all the opportunity to show mercy while they lived. The rich man begs Abraham to let him go warn his brothers so that they do not come to the same fate as he did. And Abraham answers, they have Moses and the prophets, meaning they have the morals of the Jewish law to guide them. The rich man says, no, father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will listen. Abraham responds, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Is there a connection between this story in Luke and the story of the raising of Lazarus and John? Probably. Uh, as I said last week, there uh, seems to have been some connection between the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke. Uh, not as much connection between John and Matthew and Mark. But we don't know which way the connection works. Was John familiar with Luke's Gospel or was Luke familiar with John? We just don't know. But there are places in, in the two Gospels where there are these uh, connections that are just um, uh, too, uh, have too much substance to be just coincidental. There's also an ancient document called The Secret Gospel of Mark, which was only discovered in 1958. It has a story about a young unnamed man of Bethany who's raised from the dead by Jesus at the request of the man's sister. So you, there's clearly a story in the background here um, that was in circulation, and uh, that is this story of Lazarus and John's gospel. Well, the message sent to Jesus makes, by the sisters makes clear that he is friends with this family. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Uh, there are several words for, the, uh, for love in, in Greek. Uh, this one is phileo, brotherly love, have affection for. So think Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The message is also clearly sent with a note of urgency and likely hope. As the story unfolds, there is no doubt that the sisters expected Jesus to come and that they were confident he had power to help their brother. And the text tells us he loved the sisters too. There can be no doubt that Jesus had a reputation as a remarkable healer, not just in John's gospel, but through the whole of the New Testament witness. Here, it is clear the sisters are leveraging their personal relationship with him and especially his love of their brother. Jesus receives the news, but doesn't seem particularly alarmed or even concerned. He is more than a non-anxious presence. Jesus responds, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Echoes, Jesus' response to his disciples in chapter nine, when they asked him about the man born blind, Lord, who sinned? 
this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered them at that time, neither this man sinned nor his parents. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Very similar kind of response. Martin and Wright observe, like the man's blindness, Lazarus's illness and then death is not a meaningless tragedy. Rather, it serves a larger purpose in God's plan, the revelation of God's divine glory. D. Moody Smith comments, God's glory is seen in the revelation of God through Jesus, which glorifies or reveals the Son, even as the Son reveals the Father. In what may seem callous to us and to the two sisters, Jesus remains two more days where he was. Martin and Wright observe, Jesus' response to the news about Lazarus can seem really astonishing. His beloved friends have sent word to him. Jesus knows that Lazarus is ill and he loves him dearly, and yet he waits. When our loved ones are ill, we often ask Jesus for help, and sometimes he seems to delay. John invites us to consider Jesus' words that the death is for the glory of God. Suffering and death are not meaningless. God can use them for his purposes in the world, even if their role in God's plan remains hidden to us. So the next set of verses. Lazarus has died, verses, uh, chapter 11, verses 7 to 16. Verses 7 and 8, uh, where the disciples say, let us go to Judea again, uh, remind us that this chapter is still connected to what preceded it in the gospel, and especially the division Jesus has caused among those whom he has countered and his ongoing conflict with his Jewish opponents. In chapter 10, after a discourse in which Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd and states to his opponents that he will give to his sheep eternal life and that he and the Father are one, in John 10, 31, Jesus writes, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Uh, I, I did say last week, and I, I can, you can never say this enough when we're reading John's gospel, that we need to be aware um, of how John refers to the Jews. Uh, his gospel in its final form was probably written around 90 or 100. And there was, he was probably in Ephesus or a place where there was some tension with a local synagogue and uh, an antipathy between uh, the Jewish followers of Jesus, and there were still Jewish, and the growing Gentile following of Jesus, and those Jews who uh, were not following Jesus. And it got bitter, but it was a family fight. It was an inside squabble. And, uh, and, and again, it could be very ugly, just as some of our family fights and inside squabbles can be really ugly today. But uh, it was not connected to the power uh, that later came with, with virulent anti-Semitism on the part of the state. And John's gospel has very sadly been used throughout history to justify that. Um, John's gospel refers sometimes to the Jewish opponents. Sometimes there, he's referring just to the community of, of Jews, the Judai. Um, and so we need to be really careful. But there was some hostility there, some family fight. And I think we lament that. In, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't see that at all. Matthew, Mark, and Luke never say the Jews did this or the Jews did that. They always refer to particular factions or parties within Judaism, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Herodians. Uh, and it's important to remember that the only place where you see the Jews in, in, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels is in the placard that's hung above the cross at the crucifixion, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Um, by the time Luke writes Acts, there's a little more of that tension. Uh, Paul's ministry has been going on, and you see a little bit more that looks like John's treatment. But um, uh, I just, I, again, I think it's always important to be aware of the historical context of that. We're going to see in this chapter tonight, in fact, uh, uh, Jews portrayed as those who are supporting the, the mourning sisters in their grief. So anyway, 
Uh, in chapter 10, after a discourse in which uh, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd and states to his opponents that he will give to his sheep eternal life and that he and the father are one. In John chapter 10, 31, John writes, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They accuse him of blasphemy, of being only a human being who is making himself God. So at chapter 11, 7, and 8, we're reminded that all of this is in the background and that a journey back to Judea is a dangerous undertaking for Jesus. Rabbi, teacher, why are you going to a plate? Why are you going to place yourself in danger? Martin and Wright note, just as the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and confronts the danger to his sheep head on, Jesus now courageously heads into danger to help Lazarus. These actions foreshadow what he will do on the cross, lay down his life and embrace death so that his own sheep will receive life. As he is wont to do in John's gospel, Jesus responds somewhat cryptically to those disciples. Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, those who walk in the day do not stumble. Uh, because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. While the language may have been puzzling and cryptic to the disciples, as readers we have inside knowledge. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. We were told that in chapter 6. Here is a characteristic motif of John's gospel, the contrast of light and darkness. It shows up again and again. It started out in the prologue in chapter 1. It repeats itself uh, of course, culminating in chapter six. Jesus then uses euphemistic language about death in speaking to his disciples. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. John's gospel includes lots of conversations like this between Jesus and others. He says something figurative. His listeners interpret what he says literally. The narrator makes sure we understand. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. There's some irony here, which is not uncommon in John. The disciples say if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right, and they are right. Lazarus will be all right, because in this falling asleep, Lazarus has opened the door for Jesus to act miraculously. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Martin and Wright observed that no one told Jesus Lazarus had died or even that his sickness was very serious, though I think this could be inferred from the sisters very act of summoning him. Martin and Wright make the point. Jesus is the incarnate word who knows everything pertinent to his mission. Smith writes, on any common sense human accounting, Jesus' delay is incomprehensible or even inhumane. But perhaps this is the point. This is the point. Jesus does not act in accord with common sense or even by standards of what is generally considered human. He and his revelation of God are unique, once for all, not subject to other standards. The delay has been for the disciples' faith. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. At this point, we're offered a different view of the Apostle Thomas than we're usually accustomed to. Most of us probably associate Thomas with doubting Thomas and his, the portrayal at the end of John's gospel at Easter when he demands to see the wounds of the risen Christ. Here, Thomas shows courage and faithfulness to Jesus, ready to walk with him into danger. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions coming up or any observations people want to make. Bishop, a couple of observations from the from the chats. Um, sure. Let's see. Um, Connor uh, Crafton Temple uh, makes the observation that stoning was very common at that point in time yeah. in the Middle East, and it's yeah. still common in certain areas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> in fact, uh, um, Jack, I, let me let me just speak to that for a second. Uh, we were in Israel years ago, and um, uh, we were on the Sabbath, uh, and um, uh, people were threatening to throw rocks at cars that were being driven on the Sabbath day uh, in the Jewish quarter. So 
and, and, and another time we, this wasn't stoning, but we were at the second most um, sac sacred site and uh, uh, David's tomb. And um, one of our number was taking notes. She was just a furious note taker to keep a, a log during the whole trip. And she started to write in David's tomb. And again, it was the Sabbath day and they yelled at her. No writing, no work, <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, it's serious stuff. It still goes on. What else? Um, Jack Zamboni uh, points out when you were talking about uh, anti-Semitism uh, as a result of, of or people using John uh, toward anti-Semitism, he says, and anti-Semitism on the part of the church as well as the state. Yeah, thank you. That's correct. Absolutely. Um, Todd, Todd Foster, Foster celebrated with the mention of doubting Thomas, said, yeah, Thomas. Great. Uh, and, that, that's the, and, for everyone uh, for everyone else's edification. That's the rector of St. Thomas Glassboro. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> and then uh, Marty Viet says, um, literal rather than figurative interpretations of the Bible often cause serious misunderstanding among Christians to be more specific of Jesus's words. Yeah, absolutely. There's texture to them. You know, one of the questions that I didn't address in my, in the materials I prepared, but you know, I'm always aware of, you know, we have these four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and uh, they don't always agree about everything. And I already just gave one example tonight, the, the placement of, um, uh, of the cleansing of the temple. And, you know, sometimes people uh, get worked up about that. Um, I, you know, I mean, why, why do we have these four gospels? Well, you know, I think they're like diamonds. Uh, they're facets of a diamond. We get to look at Jesus from an angle, the, the, the faith encounter that people uh, had with him. And as a result of that, there's this dynamic that keeps the whole thing very much alive for us. Um, and I think that's a great gift. So I celebrate that. Anything else? Uh, not currently, although I'll remind the people on the phone, if you want to raise your hand to be recognized, you just dial star nine on your keypad and that will raise your hand and we can call on you. Great. But that's all we have right now. All right, great. So we're in section C, the resurrection and the life, uh, chapter 11, verses 17 to 27, <clears throat> when Jesus arrives on the scene. Again, Martin and Wright uh, write, as John 11 unfolds, Jesus moves closer and closer to Lazarus's tomb. He starts in the Transjordan, enters Judea, and now he reaches the outskirts of Bethany. This slow movement toward the tomb builds tension until Jesus finally reaches Lazarus's tomb and confronts an enemy he has come to overthrow, death. I love that, I think it's a great observation. He comes to confront an enemy he has come to overthrow, death. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Uh, a, a number of the sources note that according to rabbinic lore, the spirit of the dead hovered over the body for three days. That was just a part of the, the known tradition then, that the, the spirit of the dead hovered near the body for three days. By stating that this is the fourth day, by stating that this is the fourth day, the narrator is assuring us that like Marley in Dickens' famous tale, Lazarus is most assuredly dead, and that we must be convinced of this or nothing marvelous can come of the story. Martin and Wright observed that the notation in verse 18 that Bethany was near Jerusalem only two miles away is a reminder that Jesus is in enemy territory and is in danger. In verse 19, we have an instance of John portraying the Jews without apparent vitriol. They are part of the community that is there to support the sisters and there's no overt hostility to Jesus when he shows up. There are instead questions and curiosity. By the end of the chapter, as has happened before, some will see God at work in Jesus and believe in him. Others will see and not believe. Same is true today for us, for all of us. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed home. This verse seems to portray Martha and Mary in ways similar to how they're portrayed in Luke's gospel. Martha is the one in action first, though here Mary will also arrive on the scene. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. She seems to chide him. But even still, four days later, 
her brother most assuredly dead, she still has faith and confidence that Jesus can do something. And she understands the grounds for this, Jesus' relationship with and in God. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Jesus assures her that her brother will rise again. He's making this statement in conventional terms, believed by many Jews, including the Pharisees and the Essenes, who held that there would be resurrection at the last day, the consummation of all history, when the just would be raised to eternal life in heaven and the unjust condemned to the fires of hell. Martha essentially nods her head in affirmation, indicates verbally that she's aware of and accepts this teaching. I know that he will come again, that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I can almost hear her adding in her response to Jesus, tell me something I don't already know. Actually, show me. Well, perhaps Jesus can hear this in her response as well. He answers her with his fifth and perhaps most bold, powerful, and clear I am statement yet. Remember, the I am statements are characteristic of John's gospel. I am uh, the living bread. I am, the, I am the, uh, the bread of heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Um, here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. He looks her in the eye. I know it doesn't say this in the text, but let's assume it. He looks her in the eye and he asks, do you believe this? Martha, in turn, offers what can only be understood as a complete statement of belief and faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. It is a stunning Christological confession. Christological meaning uh, the, the beliefs, the words about the Christness of Christ, about Christ as Messiah and divine. And with this, she breaks off the conversation and goes to her sister, Mary. The stunning Christological assertion, which gets it right, she breaks off the conversation, returns to her sister Mary, saying to her, the teacher is here and is calling you. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't see that anywhere in the text. She could have added, he's talking way beyond me. Perhaps you can figure it out. I don't know why she chose to break off the conversation with Jesus when she did. Perhaps she feels the conversation has entered a realm and plane beyond her, and she recognizes she needs the help of her more spiritual sister. I know, I know the Marthas of the world despise this dichotomy. It's also in Luke, but there's got to be some reason. Now, Mary had been holding down the fort, sitting shiva, receiving mourners. But with Martha's word, she leaves quickly to go to the outskirts of the town where Jesus and his disciples are apparently hanging out. Is he trying to avoid drawing attention to himself? It's not clear. But some of the mourners who were in the house with her see her leave. And assuming that she's going to the tomb, and assuming that she's going to the tomb, something which many could understand and identify with, and with sincere concern, they accompany her so that she will not be alone in her grief. Mary came where Jesus was and saw him. She knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Moody Smith observes that Mary, on meeting Jesus, kneels at his feet as an act of veneration, if not worship. And referring to her posture being at the Lord's feet, Luke's gospel writes, this may be typical of her. She makes the same lament that Martha had. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's clearly distraught, as are those who accompany her. And this has a profound effect on Jesus. We're told when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Um, Martin Wright observed uh, a comment that the word translated as perturbed connotes sternness. Uh, in the Greek, it has the connotation of snorting like a horse. There's some anger in there. And when Jesus later arrives at Lazarus's tomb, he is again perturbed, same word, uh, translated deeply troubled. Uh, it has the sense of being worked up. Jesus experiences the same troubling when the hour of his own death arrives in chapter 12, 27. And he now, and when he announces that one of his disciples will betray him in 1321, same word. In all of these occasions, Jesus, sorry about that. 
Jesus becomes stirred up because he confronts death itself, which Paul says in 1 Corinthians is the last enemy to be destroyed by God. He let out a groan of indignation from his innermost, innermost being as one of the uh, comments on that particular word uh, that I read uh, in, my, in my studies for this. Jesus is indignant about the death of Lazarus, but he also mourns the death as the loss of a friend. The crowd recognizes this. See how he loved him. Smith writes, when they say, see how he loved Phileo, how he loved him, they utter a profound truth. Quite possibly their statement is true at two levels. They may be imagined to perceive this manifestation of love by one man for another, a love that they to some extent that that to some extent is shared with the sisters. At the same time, they're witnessing, perhaps they do not know it, the love of Jesus for his disciples. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What Jesus is about to do is not only a manifestation of his God-given and God-like authority and power, but also a manifestation of his love, which is the love of God. Love, uh, and again, Smith points this out, love is an action as well as a state of mind. In fact, in, in the Bible, love is always accompanied by action. It's not just a feeling. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? It's a wonderful example, really, of the use of the irony in John's gospel. Uh, the, the way the Greek formulation of this question happens, the expected answer is yes. And of course, we know that, that it's yes. He could have done that. But if he'd done it, then this sign would not have been as powerful. So, um, so we'll go to section D and chapter 11, verses 38 to 44. But again, I want to stop and see if there are any questions or comments or anything anyone wants to add. Yeah, we have some um, we have some observations online. Before I start to read them, I'll remind the folks on the phone again, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine on your phone. Um, going back to at the very end of your, the, when we were, you were answering questions earlier, Bishop, uh, Diana Wilcox, uh, who confesses that she's an interloper from that other diocese. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Diana. Uh, yeah, great, to, great that you're on. She said, I would retitle this passage as the proclamation of Martha. As like the Samaritan woman, she proclaims who he is. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Great. I'm going to have more to say about that, though. Great. Thank you. She also agrees with Todd that Thomas is a fave. <laughs> um, oh, and then she, she adds, and now the best line, Lord, he stinketh. Yeah. Uh, and just scrolling down here. Sorry. Uh, oh, uh, Connor Crafton Temple says, the part where Jesus raising Lazarus reminds me of a song used in the Eastern Orthodox churches. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Great. Uh, and Jack Zamboni says they, we sing that all through Eastertide. Absolutely. Pascha yeah. Nostrum. Uh, and, and then Diana Wilcox again says, while at Oxford University last summer on sabbatical, I was in a class on Mary Magdalene and studied theories on Mary in Mary and Martha also being Mary Magdalene. That would resonate with, quote, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Uh, and that is all we have currently, and no hands are raised. Great. Thank you all. That's great. So we're picking up at verse 38. Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, that, that, that same word, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Of course, I, you know, I had that wonderful slide, and, I, and, and let me acknowledge that... Um, my wife, Susan, did this uh, slide just for tonight. Uh, she does them wonderfully and uh, spent the day getting that done for me. So I'm grateful. And she had that terrific slide with the tomb. Uh, and, you know, and the tomb that, um, uh, that we're talking about here is very much the same kind of tomb. It's the, the practices that were followed in the Judaism of Jesus' time in that part of the world. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, just to, just to have that kind of visual for us. And Jesus said, verse 39, take away the stone. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Jesus is in charge now. 
Martha has now appeared on the scene and ever practical said to him, Diane, he stinketh, King James, uh, all in our translation, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Again, Lazarus is dead. He's really, really, really dead. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? There did seem an inference in the last exchange between the two before Martha bolted to get Mary, that Martha didn't fully understand what Jesus meant when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. She had responded to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Uh, I'm gonna speculate, uh, and, and Diane might be in trouble with you here. Uh, she said the right words, but missed the full implications of what those words meant. I can't help thinking of Peter's confession on the road to Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And this seemed to be the right answer, and indeed it was. But when Jesus told Peter and the others what it meant for him to be the Messiah, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and three days later rise again. After he said this, Peter rebuked Jesus, and then Jesus had to rebuke Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yes, Peter had said the right words, but he didn't understand the full meaning and implication of those words. Just so, I think, with Martha. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. I think she underestimates the full magnitude of what Jesus can do. But she doesn't remain unknowing for long. They took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. Uh, Martin and Wright, through this prayer, Jesus gives us insight into his relationship with the Father. Jesus is the divine word who was with God from eternity. Remember the prologue, chapter one. The Father is always with him. Since the Father and the Son are in this perpetual relationship, the Father constantly listens to Jesus. Previously, Jesus had said, just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wishes. Again, that's back in chapter 5, um, that important chapter 5. By bringing Lazarus back to life, Jesus will reveal that he possesses the same divine power to give life and raise the dead as the Father. Before he performs this revelatory sign, Jesus offers this prayer for the crowd so that they might believe in him. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Again, this is a command. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, said to them, unbind him and let him go. Remember again that in John 5, 28, 29, Jesus said, the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do not be astonished at this for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So what is this? Has Lazarus experienced the resurrection? The story seems to be both a harbinger of Easter and a harbinger of Jesus' resurrection, but not quite resurrection. Although the question is not easy to answer definitively, I don't think. Certainly the words of John 5, 24 should ring in our ears. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Surely Lazarus fulfills this verse in every way. We should also consider what we really mean when we speak of eternal life. If eternal means eternal, it means without beginning and end. It means life not interrupted by death. A few passages from John, John 3, 14 to 16. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. John 3.36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. 
the burial bands and Lazarus's face wrapped in cloth, Jesus' direction to those around that they release and unbind him indicate that Lazarus has been resuscitated and not yet resurrected. He has been returned to life. He has been returned to the life he was living, though admittedly he will never be able to live it the same way as he had before. I wonder, did Jesus do him a favor? Um, that's really just kind of one of those questions that we could ask and uh, play around with in our minds. Uh, I, I did a lot of work. I was an English major when I was in college. And uh, I took one course that was a focus on Eugene O'Neill. And I've read just about every Eugene O'Neill play ever written. Uh, and one of the plays that Eugene O'Neill wrote was a play called Lazarus Laughed, which was a really bizarre play that was premised on uh, how Lazarus lived after he was uh, resuscitated by Jesus. And it's, uh, it's really uh, filled with kind of uh, sardonic humor and pain. And it's, a, it's a strange, strange play. It has not been performed very many times, in part because it requires a cast of over 100. But I, I always think about Lazarus laughed when I read this. Martin and Wright, Jesus brings Lazarus back to mortal life, and consequently, Lazarus will die again. The same applies to Jairus' daughter and Mark and the son of the widow of Nain and Luke and those revived by God's power through the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Resurrection is categorically different because it is the raising to a glorified, perfected, and embodied existence, not a return to ordinary mortal life. Those resurrected to glory will never die again. Of course, the question that, uh, you know, for me too, is that when we talk about living in Jesus, um, there's a piece we should understand that we're already living in the resurrected life, I think, that it's, it's not merely about what happens to us after we die. Um, none of us knows that. I, you know, my bottom line with all of this is always to, to uh, resort to Paul uh, and 1 Corinthians 13, now we see in a mirror dimly, then we shall know face to face. Now we know only in part, then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. Um, but I, I think this whole question of life in Jesus uh, in the here and now is to participate in the resurrected life of Jesus. And I think that's a really significant and important thing for us to understand, even as we hope, uh, have the hope of, uh, of what will happen after our bodies die here. Uh, Smith writes, the raising of Lazarus is an appropriate conclusion to the public ministry of Jesus. It is the culminating sign. Moreover, it symbolizes, or better, gives concrete manifestation to the life-giving work of Jesus, who does what God has given him authority to do. So, um, I'll come back to that one. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and open it up again for observations, questions, and thoughts from anyone. Okay, um, so we have a, a hand raised from Louise Wagner. Uh, Louise, I'm going to unmute you, and then I'll lower your hand. Okay. You're unmuted. Well, yes, uh, Bishop, you stated that, you know, you didn't know if God did Lazarus a favor, but I, I think the point was not to do Lazarus a favor, yeah. yep. but rather to glorify God and also to do us a favor so that Amen. we're aware. I completely agree with you. Yeah, okay. I completely agree with you. Thank yeah. you. I'm not arguing with you. Just make yeah. it a comment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then um, online, uh, bon I lost it there. Bonnie Bivens uh, asks, so is eternal life present and future or just future? You know, I mean, that's why I asked the question, because my understanding of eternity is there's no point of beginning or end. Eternity is eternity. Uh, and then my own observation, if I, if I can, um, I'm always drawn to the story of, of Lazarus, not, not just because of the glory of God that's revealed and, and the, the raising of the, de the, the, the dead friend there, but also what it reveals of, of Jesus, his, his humanity, you know, the, the uh, uh, what is it, uh, 35, uh, 
11, verse 35, Jesus began to weep. Even right. though Jesus knows what he's, what he's about to do, right. that he's, he's, bringing Jesus, uh, he's bringing Lazarus back from the dead. His friend is dead and everybody there is sad and Jesus yeah. mourns with them like any person would do. And then he goes and does this extraordinary thing that, that always, it, it really resonates with me as, as a Jesus man and God, right? There. I think that's a wonderful and beautiful observation. I'm glad you brought it out. Absolutely. Uh, and I don't see any other, uh, any other hands raised or comments. I'll, I'll just remind the folks on the phone again, uh, star nine to raise your hand, but that's all we have right now. So we hit the last uh, section of this, and um, the whole thing takes a decidedly nasty turn. Um, it, uh, you know, as I said, as has happened throughout John's gospel, Jesus' performance of a sign, this culminating sign, the raising of Lazarus causes division. Uh, verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. So, you know, here he, he brings a bunch of people see this, they do see that glory. Um, and, uh, and that has been the point of it, that it brings people to belief in Jesus. Uh, that's, you know, when, when, when Jesus uh, departed with the disciples to go to Lazarus, why? It was so they would believe in him. Uh, with Mary, that you may believe in me. And then uh, here with this, this crowd of folk who had gathered around uh, Martha and Mary to help them mourn, see this, and they come to believe in him. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's a constant motif in, the, in this gospel. Um, but some of them uh, don't. And they go to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. Uh, and clearly, um, uh, there's a negative there. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. And, um, you know, we, it's probably a good thing here to acknowledge that they had a legitimate concern. And, um, and even if you read that, uh, and, uh, and, and read it and place it in the setting of Jesus, it was a legitimate concern. The Romans were brutal and the Romans protected their power and they protected their authority and control. Um, it's, it also is probably worthwhile remembering that by the time this gospel reaches its final form, somewhere between 90 and 100, in fact, the Romans have destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, and uh, there had been a Jewish revolt, uh, and the Romans came down uh, with the full force of the Roman Empire. So their concern expressed here is a legitimate concern. And one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Uh, you do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. So, um, uh, I, 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 I'm gonna, I, I have to say this, I, I'm hearing some echoes of that somewhat in the, the elderly should be willing to die for the economy. Um, but uh, we won't go there fully. But, uh, but uh, you know, hear the notion that it would be better for us to sacrifice Jesus, this wonder worker, than it would be for the Romans to come and destroy the whole country uh, because they feel threatened by him and by the fact that folks think he's the Messiah. Um, so, um, and, and it says the comment, the commentary on this in the narrator says he did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation and not for the whole nation only, but to gather into one, the dispersed children of God. So again, there's this kind of irony here because Caiaphas says it in a very pragmatic political way, but on the other hand, from the perspective of the Christian faith, the death of Jesus is, in fact, for the sake of all, right? Who calls us all back to, uh, uh, re to redeem us for, for God. So there's this wonderful double meaning going on uh, in this text that's quite powerful. And so from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Jesus no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there uh, to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with his disciples. 
and the Passover of the Jews was near and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? Now the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. As is again happened throughout John's gospel, Jesus' performance of a sign causes division. Many of those who had seen what Jesus had done believed in him, others did not, went to the religious authorities. Again, the dilemma faced by the religious authorities is real. Um, again, Caiaphas is pragmatic and prophetic. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. And on this note, we turn our eyes toward Holy Week. So again, I'll just ask her any questions, observations from anyone. Yeah, uh, we have a raised hand from uh, Mitchell Sealing. Mitchell, I will unmute you and then I'll lower your hand. Mitchell. Okay, well, I'm gonna try to unmute you again. All right, Mitchell, maybe you need to unmute yourself because it's not working on my side. Okay. All right. I don't know why it wasn't working on your side, but um, my uh, my observation uh, it, it is, is kind of staying with this, but going back a little bit to, uh, to, to, to when Jesus raised Lazarus, um, in John 5, as you gave to us, and in other gospel passages, which I don't remember the chapters or the verses, Jesus, sa Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. And in chapter 5, when he says, the dead will raise, be raised out of, out, out of their tombs, there means multiple. But, but in that instance, it, if we only go by sight, it was Lazarus. Right. Being yeah. raised, but everybody else was being raised out of their tombs, mm -hmm. spiritually speaking. Right. Witnessed, and that's oh, nice. the, yeah. the, the vision occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Nice observation. Thank you for that. You know, and I think that one of the one, one of the things to say too is that you know in that in, in that um, uh, in that world you know, among the Pharisees, for example, the general belief was that there would be that there would be a general resurrection of the dead at the last day. And you were kind of, I guess, in the suspended state of limbo or something like that uh, until that until that general resurrection took place. Today, I think we think more of, you know, you, you're resurrected uh, to, to just if you die a good person and, or in God's grace, you know, and, um, and go to hell if you don't or whatever the belief in that is for different folk. And uh, uh, both Robert Markowski and Sally Marr uh, just complimented Mitchell on that observation. Yeah, great observation. Um, and then uh, Connor Crafton Temple uh, says, this reminds me of when Bishop Robinson was consecrated as a bishop. When change happens, there will always be a division that's happy and a division that isn't. In the Gospels, mm -hmm. it's the people who go to the Pharisees. And in Bishop Robinson's case, it was conservative members of our church. Uh, and then uh, let's see, Connor then has a, uh, an observation. A modern version of that would be suspended animation or cryogenic freezing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Uh, and then I see uh, Jack Zamboni has his hand raised. Jack, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, oops, sorry. I also muted you again. <laughs> now you're unmuted. Thanks. Um, uh, Bishop, you said earlier that that um, uh, this resurrection life is something to participate now, not just after um, we die. And uh, the question on my mind and on my heart is, what could it mean to be participating in the resurrection life now in, yeah. in this situation we're in? I, yeah. right. I would love your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I think it's a really great question. And I'm not sure I have a great answer, except to say, you know, that uh, for me, uh, as I understand this, um, in the spiritual journey, 
we are constantly trying to, to walk by God's grace toward union with God. And to the degree, I think about, for example, um, St. John of the Cross uh, and, uh, and clearing ourselves, denuding ourselves of all things uh, in prayer and in our spirituality. And to the degree that we can do that, we come closer to union with God. And I think that the mystical tradition probably gives us the best picture of what that might look like. So uh, I think fundamentally it means casting aside all fear and having absolute confidence that God is love and that in God's love, God draws all things to God's love. Um, and, and more than that, I'm not, you know, now I see in a mirror dimly. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's kind of how I envision it. I, I think, you know, I think um, uh, the nirvana is kind of that same you know, in, in another world religion, that the world religions tend to have these kinds of senses where we find, if, if, if we're able to find ourselves in oneness with God, and uh, for us as Christians, it's always with God in Christ, um, then all things resolve themselves. Uh, and Thank those you. are all the questions, comments I see online now. So you know what, I have a few, because I think we've got a few minutes left. I'm, I'm, my feeling is to, is to try to end by 8.30, and I do have Compline built into the slide presentation so we can end with Compline. I thought that would be a nice thing to do. But before we do that, I, I, I don't have the questions on a slide, but I do have them in front of me, and I had them on the guide. And so I think I'm just going to throw them out there, and if anyone wants to raise their hand and jump in. Um, I, uh, the first question I read is kind of is not dissimilar to the one Jack just asked, and that is, as we read this passage in the midst of a world pandemic, what part of the passage, A, speaks to us, B, challenges or puzzles us, or C, gives us hope? As we read the passage in the midst of a world pandemic, what part of it speaks to us, challenges or puzzles us, or gives us hope? And I'm trying to help out the preachers who have to preach this text on Sunday. Anyone want to take a shot at that? I, I think I began the I think I began the session by indicating one possibility, um, you know, and that is I think that we at this stage can all identify with the feelings of the two sisters with their grief and their sorrow. Um, I think there's some of that going on for most of us today. Uh, Kate Mason adds in the, in the chat, the challenge I have is that it does seem cruel to let Lazarus die only to bring him back. That's why I said, did he do him a favor? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, 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 but I completely agree. This was not for Lazarus. It was for the sake of the whole. And, and again, I, I don't know Lazarus well enough to tell you how he responded, right? Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things we know is that it later reported in John that they would try to kill him, that the sign was such a threat. You know. Uh, and Connor's hand is raised. I'm going to unmute you, Connor. Uh, and then you're unmuted now, Connor. All right. Uh, so so I uh, personally agree with the... Um, uh, finish up on what he said, you know, like, I'm from a freehold where that uh, family is all on um, like vents in the um, ER. Um, yeah. uh, and like, I'm uh, like, uh, kind of like uh, sh sh shocked at that, um, as were the uh, uh, sisters in the um, uh, gospel because there's like actually so close to us and um, like. The uh, gospels are uh, supposed to, to kind of help us um, like understand like what's going on and like how we should feel about uh, certain things and not feel about uh, 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 things like uh, death. So, thank you. And that's, you know, that's why I tried to underscore the, the, the whole theme of eternal life in John's gospel that says, enter into it here and now. You know, I, I love, I've, I've, some of you have heard me quote, uh, I'm paraphrasing a priest named Dennis Maynard, who has written a couple of nice books. Um, 
uh, but in one of them, he said, uh, said something I never forgot. He said, sometimes some people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good, you know. And, um, and, I, and I think that we're here, God's called us here uh, to be in the earth, uh, and I think to, to love and celebrate God and God's love. And, and yes, we're challenged. We're challenged by suffering all the time. And yet, in the midst of all of that, God, uh, God's love is still abundant. Uh, I was terribly moved by the, by the priest in Italy who gave up his um, uh, uh, ventilator for a younger patient. And, I mean, you know, wow, there it is, right in front of us. Um, and, and I'm confident, uh, you know, of, uh, of that decision and, and the faithfulness of that priest in doing that. Wow, stunning. Uh, from Jane Brady Close, um, we tend to think of resurrection as individual, mm -hmm. but we also focus on mystical unity with God as an important goal slash end. Do we always have to keep our ideas of resurrection as individual? Would that change how we regard eternal life? Mm. You know, I think, again, uh, Jane, that's a great question, and I, it's beyond me. It's, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, when we read the book of Revelation, which is such an uh, enigmatic, puzzling book, you know, it's striking to me that, um, at, that, that the whole thrust of that book is for heaven to come to earth rather than the other way around, rather than destruction, you know. And so that says something to me about an overarching resurrection of, of, of the creation in some way, shape, or form. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but um, that's one, one idea and one image that comes to mind for me. Uh, and, and Connor uh, mentions that uh, I think that the Roman Catholic Church is making that priest a martyr. Well, they, you know, there, there's, a, there's a tradition uh, and, a, and a history behind that, that when there have been pandemics, that those who give their lives have been uh, declared martyrs by the church. Uh, and we've seen that in, the, in our tradition of the martyrs of Memphis. Um, Bonnie Bivens uh, observes, uh, what gives us hope during the coronavirus is the joy that belief in Jesus brings eternal life. Amen. Amen. I think that's precisely right. What else? And I see, I see that Maria Hassanin has uh, her hand raised. Maria, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Bishop. Now. Hi, all. Hi, let me put my video on. I'm, I'm not on video. Okay, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, just a quick question. Speaking about Lazarus and yep. what Jesus did, in, and I hope this is an appropriate question. Um, do you think that Jesus, when he did this, knowing that, word would spread do you think deep deep down inside he was getting scared you know uh, that's a great question maria and, Thank you. and and if i answer it from the perspective of john's gospel i'm going to uh -huh. say no because in john's gospel jesus has absolute confidence and does everything with full purpose and understanding of what's coming now if you ask me from the perspective of mark's gospel I might have to say yes. And I, there's, you know, in Mark's gospel, I, I find it profoundly moving that from the cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, right. this absolute abandon. That he's in the garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and, you know, and if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. You would never hear that in John's gospel. So, you know, I, I, I mean, that's really the interesting piece about having four gospels that give us different. Uh, right different views um, and where you want to land um, is where God calls you in prayer um, at, at any given moment in terms of, Correct. Terms of you know, I mean, it's I basically, I don't know if I'm helping you or not, but that's, no, you are. And, and, and I, and from my point of view, it's, I, I'm getting into the Bible now. It's a very simple minded question, but no, it's not. It was a great question. It was <laughs> okay. a great question. Thank I was you. afraid to ask. Thank you. No, no, never be afraid. Never be afraid. Okay. To ask. <laughs> okay thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, that's all I see right now. Well, then let's, okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, let me, let me see if I have one more. Um, so let me, let me, let me ask this one. If you were the preacher this coming Sunday, what would be the good news? And I'll share a story with you. I've shared this with some of the clergy, maybe all of the clergy. Um, I remember early in my ministry when I was, um, 
a seminarian. I, actually, I was a seminarian. And I was at St. Luke in the Fields, uh, which is in New York City, a church in New York City. I did my field placement there for two and a half years that I was in seminary. And I preached a sermon. And um, one, of the, one of the real challenges of preaching at St. Luke in the Fields is that on any given Sunday morning, half the faculty of General Theological Seminary was in the congregation. And um, I preached a sermon one Sunday morning that uh, I, I thought was prophetic and I don't remember. I don't remember the sermon at all, and I remember what's going on in the world. But at the end of the sermon, uh, Neil Alexander came up to me. Uh, he was the professor of preaching, and we were good friends, actually. Uh, he was the professor of preaching at General, and Neil said, "Well, Chip, I don't think the good news quite overcame the bad news this week." <laughs> so, so um, my question is to the preachers: What's the good news out of this story? Is it okay if a non-preacher answers sure. that one? No, I said if you were the preacher. I didn't say. It had to be, <laughs> okay. I didn't say any clergy. I said if you were the. And preacher. I apologize, Steve, for not following proper etiquette. But as you well know, I can't raise my hand, so um, I just had to to jump in, and and I just you know, um, I think my answers to the first questions you asked and this question are pretty much the same because for me. Um, resurrected life, um, as well as good news, um, really kind of all boils down to, you know, the, the two really strong themes throughout this, which are, are love and presence, you know, and so again, that, you know, really coming to understand, you know, God's pervasive presence right here on earth right now, just like he was one of these little squares on the Zoom screen, right? Yeah. Right in, in the middle of everything that we're doing right now. And, you know, thinking about Jesus weeping first when Lazarus died and, and, and really joining in the suffering. Um, and I see that popping up on the chat screen over here also as a, as a theme that, you know, that God really not only understands our suffering, but enters into it with us. And loves us so much, and yeah. you know has that presence. See how much he loves him. Exactly. Right? Isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, there. See how much he loves him. Wow. Yep. That, that that could be a sermon. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. so I think that's that's part of it. And then also, you know, the love that he shows when he raises Lazarus, yeah. and you know that is a collective kind of love because that's God's presence for the community. Yeah. You know, the community that's all around that's watching Lazarus be raised, and what does that really mean? you know, for how they go about their lives when they walk away from that place, you know. So I think those two things are, you know, again, it's those are the things that resonate with me about resurrected life right now, as well as resurrected life, whatever that looks like when we, when we uh, pass away. Um, and then also, um, you know, the, the good, that's, what better news could there be? <laughs> I don't know. Right. Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> Others. Uh, and then in the in the chats catching up a little bit um jack damboni points out he's preaching on ezekiel and, and <laughs> kate mason says, says he's right. cheating <laughs> right um kate also says one answer the good news is that god via jesus truly understands suffering yeah yeah and uh, overcome and, and overcomes it i think right and overcomes it i mean that's really you know isn't that the signal message of this faith that 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 we've inherited, that is our gift and grace, that it, it does not, um, you know, there's no way we can avoid suffering. And our faith goes right there. We do nothing to duck that suffering. Uh, in fact, uh, we're about to have the whole of our church year culminate on a cross and yet not end on a cross and on Easter morning. Um, that's, you know, there's something about that. Um, that, uh, that I, I think is the, the thing that in our heart of hearts uh, we know is true and the, you know that that God overcomes all of that and and you know and again we see that we see that's why I, that's why I said that I feel that Lazarus is a hint and harbinger of Easter it's pointing us in that direction and Easter gives us the full message uh, Diana Wilcox says God will come to us no matter the tomb in which we find ourselves. Nice. We all will find ourselves in the tomb from time to time, in those dark places where death seems to stinketh all around us. For some, that time is now. Yet Jesus will come to us, even if we do not want to come out. Amen. Good for you. I, I listened to that sermon. 
Thank you. Uh, Maria Hassanen says, uh, good news is God is always with us and the light of Christ is here, even if it feels dark right now. Um, and oh, Connor, uh, Connor says, I'm an EMT and I study disaster preparedness and emergency management at Rowan University. And the good news would be that we will eventually get through the COVID-19 pandemic or that the people who have perished during the pandemic are no longer suffering. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thank you for your service. I'm so grateful for you. Yeah. Uh, Todd Foster, uh, Jesus didn't raise everyone who died that day slash week slash month, just one, a sign, symbol, promise of what was to come. If we're numbered among Mary and Martha, who presumably died more conventionally, then even as we die, we can die as Jesus's friends, knowing that death is no obstacle to God's love for us. Yeah. Great sermon. Good. Uh, and then Louise Wagner's hand is raised. Louise, I will try to unmute you. You are unmuted. Well, yes, we were saying, uh, the bishop was saying how, you know, we don't shirk suffering and no, our religion does not shirk suffering. But then we get past the Passion Week and we get to Easter and then we get to the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful time. Amen. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, Louise, uh, you just stay with me. You keep you keep bringing me around there. Good for you. Okay. Thank you. Good. What else? Uh, and then um, Jane Brady Close. For me, but I'm not preaching, Jesus is weeping. In the midst of all this death is good news. Our ability to weep is good news. We perhaps are called to extend our own weeping, not only for humanity, but for the earth and all the species which have become extinct, the one third or more of avian species in a few decades, why are we not weeping for the earth itself and all the other species which support our Thank you, Jane. It's yeah. a great option. Uh, and that is the last of what we have posted or hand raised. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, next week uh, is Palm Sunday. I mean, we're, we're heading toward Palm Sunday. so. The lectionary uh, focuses on two things, and I think we'll explore both of them. We'll look at, again, we'll stick with year A, and we'll look at Matthew's account of Palm Sunday. And I'll have a study guide out there for you, but we'll look at Matthew's account of Palm Sunday, and then we'll look at Matthew's passion. Uh, again, that's a very long body of material to address. So, you know, what I think I'm going to try to do is simply look at highlights. We'll, we'll spend a, a little bit of time at the beginning, look at the at Matthew's Palm Sunday account, and then, uh, and then get into the passion. And, uh, and I think look for the, the uh, you know, the overall uh, story, but, but also look at what, uh, what's in Matthew that's uh, noteworthy for us in particular. So, and I'll probably say a little bit about Matthew at the beginning of that whole thing. <clears throat> so, um, so that's it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, I have Compline on the slides. And so we can say Compline together. Uh, please do, even though everyone's muted, please do feel free to respond. If you weren't muted, we'd hear all of this delay and staggering. It wouldn't be too much fun. So I'm going to say both parts as we go through this, um, just so that we can hear the responses. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Uh, we'll just say Psalm 31 in unison. <clears throat> In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me.
Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net they have secretly sent for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <clears throat> Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Before I pray this uh, prayer, I'd like us to keep a moment of silence and to pray for those who need our prayers, uh, to pray for the world, to pray especially for those who are impacted by, we're all impacted by this pandemic, but those most immediately affected and impacted, and especially those who are sick, those who are living in fear, those who are grieving, for those in uh, on the first line of our responders who are going into places, exposing them, who are treating patients uh, each and every day, doctors and nurses and EMTs, firemen and policemen, and, uh, and all those who are keeping essential services going in the midst of this pandemic who are exposing themselves. Pray for all those whom you love and care about and who you worry about. Pray for yourselves. And we give thanks for the love that is expressed in times like these. And we pray for and thanksgiving for those who continue to minister and care for through soup kitchens and food pantries and shelters and all kinds of things. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary. Bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being part of this Bible study. I loved the observations and comments and questions, and so it was great to be with you. God keep you this week, and I hope you'll join me and us next week. Take care.